Hello and welcome to another video review. This is the 2015 reboot of Star Wars Battlefront for PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. And this is coming to you courtesy of Gamma12. He sent me this. Thank you, it is greatly appreciated. This is a first or third person shooter, depending on which camera perspective you choose, developed by DICE and published by EA in November of 2015, and if you've seen my video on the beta of this, you know that I really wasn't looking forward to actually playing the full version, simply because the beta was such a terrible first impression. It was all style and no substance, and really didn't play much of anything like the original Star Wars Battlefront or Battlefront 2, and of course, with the concern over how little content is actually in this game, it was very unfavorably compared to those two games. But of course that was going off of the beta and of course the pre-release announcements regarding the game, so let's go ahead and delve into this thing and find out exactly how it is, particularly now that it's had its first DLC, which was the Battle of Jakku. Well, as far as the presentation goes, they pretty much nailed it in nearly every regard. This game looks phenomenal. Everything is modeled down to the smallest detail. The texture quality is excellent. The animations are very smooth and fluid for the most part, although the hero animations can be a bit wonky sometimes. And in particular, the particle effects and explosions look absolutely fantastic in this thing. And when you go to the sound design, there's two particular aspects of it that are downright phenomenal. First off, the sound effects themselves. They absolutely nailed the Star Wars sound effects. Everything sounds exactly as you would expect it to after having seen the movies. And so when you're firing those blasters or swinging your lightsaber or whatever it may well be, it sounds absolutely fantastic. And if you're in a valley or gorge environment, Environment, the echo is phenomenal as well. Likewise, they nailed the soundtrack, but then again, it is just reusing the John Williams score for the most part, so it's of course fitting, but of course, since it's not original to this game, there's not really much to say there. But then there's the one really nasty part of the sound design, and that is the voice acting. Well, some of it anyway. When it comes to the normal battle chatter between the various soldiers, it sounds actually rather good. It's exactly as you'd expect, and is pretty high quality. But then there are the heroes apart from Emperor Palpatine. You see, Palpatine is voiced by Sam Witwer, who voiced him in the Star Wars Rebels series, and he actually does a rather good Emperor Palpatine voice. So the Emperor actually sounds pretty good, and Boba Fett sounds okay, not amazing, but everyone else sounds downright awesome. Awful. Darth Vader in particular just sounds laughably bad. Your weakness is your undoing. And it's kind of weird that they managed to get the visuals down so well and get the sound effects and the music down so well, and then they skimped on the voice acting. At least they finally patched in the Hoth outfit for Luke Skywalker instead of having him run around in his black outfit with his green lightsaber and Hoth. But the proper Hoth outfit for Luke wasn't added until January, and in fact they added it along with Han Solo's proper Hoth outfit, which of course I didn't notice until I actually got my hands on the patch notes because I didn't have the full game until now, and Han Solo wasn't in the beta. And hell, they just patched in the proper indoor outfit for Princess Leia, and that's as I'm recording this video, was a couple of days ago in the February update. It's just kind of baffling that they would put so much time and effort into making everything as authentic as possible and then just screw up entirely when it comes to certain parts of the authenticity. It doesn't make any sense, but at least the presentation overall is generally pretty fantastic. But of course what really matter here are the story and the gameplay, except in this one the story doesn't really matter because it is just various battles set in the Galactic Civil War. There is no single player campaign, instead you get a series of missions that you can play either solo or co-op, which are generally set up after things that you would find in the normal versus multiplayer, except that they include things like the survival mode where you're trying to hold off against waves of enemies, and if you've seen my MTO on the beta of this, then you've seen that mode. It's just a pretty basic horde mode, and pretty much everything else that you'll find is just the offline version of things that you'll find in the normal multiplayer, so I'm really going to talk more about the multiplayer itself than anything else. Pretty much nobody is playing this thing for the single player or even the co-op because it feels incredibly tacked on. 
And when you go to the multiplayer, things really aren't that much different from the single player, actually, in terms of feeling like things were tacked on. The game feels like it was built entirely around the Walker Assault mode and nothing else. While they do give you a few modes to mess around with, the only one that really does feel fleshed out and actually like it's worth anything is the Walker Assault mode. The others are generally smaller scale and they are much more nuanced like the Fighter Squadron mode, where you fly around in a starfighter and dogfight with other starfighters until various ships show up that you need to destroy or defend, in which case you still continue dogfighting and you just try to prevent the enemy team from destroying your ship, or you're trying to destroy the enemy's ship. And and it's a pretty straightforward mode, you're basically just fighting for points. Other modes include things like cargo, which is straight up capture the flag only with cargo instead of flags. Drop zone, which is kind of a king of the hill mode, or if you've seen my MTL in the beta, you've seen this mode as well. The drop pod shoots in and then you have to secure it and hold it for a length of time until you'll eventually get points. If you can't see the pattern here, it's basically just modes that you've seen in every other FPS in the past decade, only with a Star Wars coat of paint and the mechanics of the Battlefront reboot applied to them, which means that basically nobody plays anything but the Walker Assault mode in this. You might occasionally get into a Fighter Squadron match or a Heroes vs. Villains or maybe a Cargo match, but more often than not, they are not going to be full games and people will be rage quitting an awful lot. Now, I'll go back to the Heroes vs. Villains mention later, but let's go ahead and talk about the actual core mechanics of this. You have your blaster and you have three item slots. Two of the item slots are just basic cards that have a cooldown. So for example, a thermal detonator or the sniper rifles that you can get, or the jump pack or things like that. The other slot is for your charge slot and these are various powers that require charge in order to actually use. You can find charge pickups as you run around the maps as long as you have a charge power equipped. And speaking of pickups, there are a bunch of other things you can find scattered throughout the map. Things like the infantry turrets or vehicle turrets that are better against infantry or vehicles respectively. Or droids that will follow you around and scan enemies and occasionally attack them. Or things like the orbital strike or the thermal imploder which are very very powerful weapons that you can use. Things like that. And those occupy the fourth slot that you get and they are not replenishable. So where your first First and your third are just on a cooldown timer, and your second slot, your charge slot, it requires charge pickups to use. The fourth slot is a one use and then done kind of deal. Now when you go to edit your loadout, you're going to find when you start off the game that you have absolutely nothing available to you. The only thing you get is your basic blaster and nothing else. If you want to do anything in this game, you're going to have to unlock it using the credits and level system that are in this game. The level system is much the same as any other modern FPS. You gain experience points by completing objectives, killing enemies, doing whatever really in-game. And once you get past a certain threshold, you will level up and unlock new things. And by unlock things, I mean unlock the ability to purchase those things with the in-game credits that you earn. The credits are earned by simply playing the game and doing whatever in-game. And whatever points you earn specifically for a match are converted into credits at a much lower rate. So, for example, if you get 7,000 points in-game, you're going to earn 700 credits for it. You can then go to edit your loadout and if you have unlocked something but you haven't purchased it yet, you can then purchase it as long as you have the requisite amount of credits for it and then it is available to you from then on out. The thing is that it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to have them have the credit system and the level system because it does two things. The first of these is turn the game into a complete grind. The second is give players who have put more time into the game objective advantages over newer players. Eventually you will unlock abilities that will actually give you statistical advantages over other players, in addition to simply having better weapons and more stuff to work with in terms of actual items. So to give you an example, you don't unlock the jump pack until level 13. The thing is that it took me about 6-7 to seven hours to get to that point. 
and the jump pack itself is pretty much required for certain maps, otherwise you're just going to be running around in circles for quite some time without anything happening. And because the thermal detonator is one of the earliest things you unlock, pretty much everybody uses it, and thus grenade spam is ridiculous. Even worse than Call of Duty 4, and Call of Duty 4 had some of the worst grenade spam you will ever see in any video game ever. So the unlock system ends up being really problematic and in fact is actually worse than even Battlefield 4 and Battlefield 4 had one of the most unbalanced unlock systems I've seen in quite some time. I honestly can't figure out what DICE is thinking at this point considering their unlock systems have gotten worse with each subsequent game they put them in. So if that trend continues then the next Battlefield game will have the worst unlock system of all time most likely but I digress. Apart from the ridiculous amount of star cards that you can get that will give you various items that you can use in game as well as the ones that will give you various stat bonuses, you can also use your credits to unlock new blasters as well as new options for your appearance. Of course, the appearance options are downright laughable for the most part. I mean, you get male or female, stormtrooper or rebel trooper, and you can pick the head that shows up on it. If you're on the Rebel Alliance side, you can pick alien heads to change things up so you can be a Twi'lek or a Quarren or something like that. But those aren't unlocked until really, really late in the progression, as in the Twi'lek is unlocked at rank 50. And even then, it's only one head type. You don't get to customize, say, if you're a Twi'lek, you don't get to choose whether you're blue-skinned or red-skinned or whatever it may well be. Nor can you even pick the language that your character speaks, because Twi'leks speak more than simply their own language. Obviously, in a lot of cases, they speak Galactic Basic, so if you wanted your Twi'lek speaking actual basic, then, well, too bad, because they're not going to do it. Hell, you can't even pick whether it's a male or female Twi'lek. It's always a female Twi'lek. And the same thing goes for the other alien races as well. The Quarren are all male, the Rodians are all male, etc. And when you get over to the Imperial side of things, it gets more amusing because they're only humans, because the Empire is of course pro-human and nothing else. And the appearance options you unlock at the end of that progression are the Shadow Trooper armor and the Scout Trooper armor, which are only for male troopers apparently, even though we know that female troopers exist. whatever. Point being that the appearance stuff feels like it was a complete afterthought that they threw in there just to have something with regards to appearance customization and probably just so you could waste more credits. Credits that could be spent much better by actually getting a new blaster or getting a new star card with the star cards being preferable to the blasters because honestly the blasters you start with are a decent middle of the road. The only real difference between the ones that the Empire and the Rebels get is rate of fire and honestly I find that the rate of fire is generally more important in that particular case simply because pretty much everything else on those two blasters is completely equal. Once you get beyond those two blasters is where things get a bit more interesting because you have your blasters that are basically heavy machine guns, you have one that's a three round burst rifle, you have a couple that are high damage but low rate of fire, and of course you have a bunch of blaster pistols that are generally a higher rate of fire and much more dangerous up close than they are at longer ranges. The thing is that the DL-44 blaster is objectively the best gun in the entire game. It does very high damage, it has a decent rate of fire, it's generally fairly accurate, and it is accurate out to a ridiculously long range. They seem to have nerfed it a bit since launch, but it's still a ridiculously powerful weapon that you only unlock really, really late in the progression. And up close, the only thing that's better is the shotgun blaster that you get, which is basically the ion blaster that the Jawas had in the uh, original Star Wars movie. But if you use that thing, then you're effectively useless at any range beyond really, really close to the enemy. More often than not, what you're going to find is people using the two that you start with because they're just generally well-rounded and not really good or bad at any one particular thing. The T-21B, which is a slow rate of fire but very high damage blaster rifle that has a scope on it. The burst fire blaster pistol, which basically melts anything that it comes up against. Or the RT-97C, which is the second of the machine gun style blasters that you unlock and is generally good at pretty much everything. 
You might, of course, see people using other things as they've unlocked them and they're just trying to mess around with things or just for personal preference, but generally as long as you can keep your shots on target, it's not that big of a deal. The problem is that these are blasters and they are clumsy and random, which means that the shots go in a cone of fire, which makes the shots actually connecting with the target something of a matter of chance. You see, this thing doesn't really have describable weapon handling. Each of the blasters just seems to randomly spew bolts all over the place. And while the first couple of shots might be relatively accurate, once you get past that, you are going to find that the shots connecting with the target are just a matter of chance. There's no recoil pattern to speak of for any of the weapons, so it's not like you can compensate for recoil, you just kind of have to adjust every single time one of your shots goes off target. And thus the combat feels incredibly spammy, you're just firing blaster bolts in the general direction of the enemy, you're firing them at the enemy, they're going all over the place instead of actually hitting what you're aiming at. It's just completely unsatisfying, even though you do get some really nice particle effects and you get great sound and everything. The weapons themselves just don't feel good to use. I mean, obviously we don't really have any real-world analogs to pattern the recoil and such after with these blasters because, I mean, who knows how a blaster is supposed to handle. It's wildly inconsistent even between the various movies. But unfortunately, DICE decided to make the game extremely casual in the weapon handling and thus you have all weapons that are basically fully automatic regardless of their rate of fire and which all have an overheat mechanic instead of actually using ammunition, so they have infinite ammo, they just overheat gradually. And if it does manage to overheat, it's not really that big of a deal because the cooldown period really isn't very long at all, and even if you want to accelerate that, they do have a mechanic where when the bar passes over a yellow portion, you can actually press the R key or whatever it is on the console, and you will instantly cool down your weapon and thus you can resume firing. So it's extremely simplistic very easy to pick up and play, and that generally permeates the vast majority of this game. It is very easy to pick up and play, it's just that unlike a lot of games that are easy to pick up but challenging to master, this has absolutely nothing to master. The game has basically no depth to it, and barely any teamwork at all. There's no class system anymore, any loadout you want you can have, and all of the loadout items are basically just power-ups for you personally, and not really anything that will actually help your team out in the long run. And even if there is stuff that will help your team out, why bother when you can get a jump pack, or you can get that super powerful sniper rifle, or other grenades, or whatever it may well be, and get yourself the extra kills and such. There's no way to set up dynamic gameplay. You can't have armor pushes because the vehicles in this game are power-ups that you find on the battlefield instead of actual vehicles that you can get in and have some actual combined arms warfare. It's very clear they compartmentalized everything. The air vehicles are meant to fight other air vehicles. The ground vehicles are meant to get you a ton of kills and not much else. In fact, the only ground vehicles that exist in this game are speeder bikes, which are only available on Endor, and ATSTs, which only the Empire gets. The Rebels only get access to X-Wings, A-Wings, and air speeders. Nothing else. That gives the Imperials blatant advantages over the Rebels, because, I mean, they don't get any ground vehicles to help counter the ground vehicles that the Empire gets. And if you think that the Starfighters are going to help you out there, then you're sorely mistaken because it's actually rather hard to hit things on the ground even though you can do strafing runs. Even then, the controls for the air vehicles are so bad that you're not going to be able to do strafing runs very well anyway. It may be slightly easier on a gamepad, but on keyboard and mouse, it's pretty much impossible to stay on target very well. And while the airspeeders technically get a special ability where they can take down the AT-ATs with the tow cable, unfortunately I've never actually seen that happen. Either the airspeeder gets destroyed before they get a chance to do it, or they attempt to do the tow cable takedown and it just doesn't work out very well. Because the minigame you're required to do to actually take down the AT-ATs that way is fairly difficult. So the air vehicles end up just fighting other air vehicles for the most part, and thus they don't really contribute anything to your team either, so it's just kind of a free-for-all. You run into the match, you get as many kills as you possibly can before you die, you respawn, and you repeat the process. And that is absolutely personified by the heroes that you can get access to if you got a power-up while running around the map, or if you're playing one of the modes that actually starts you out as a hero, like, say, Heroes vs. Villains. 
Regardless, there are three heroes for each team. On the Empire side, you get Darth Vader, Emperor Palpatine, and Boba Fett. And on the Rebel side, you get Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, and Princess Leia. Each of them gets three special abilities and a primary weapon, and the primary weapon is pretty much what you would expect for each of the characters. For example, Luke and Darth Vader both get lightsabers, the Emperor shoots lightning from his hands, Princess Leia and Han both get blasters. And Princess Leia and the Emperor are special in that they can actually spawn honor guards, which are basically mini hero units. They get a very specific loadout and they can take a lot more damage than most other players can, but they can't regenerate their health. But they do spawn wherever the Emperor or Princess Leia is, so they're very useful if you need to get into the fray very quickly, and they are great for getting a bunch of kills, of course. But that's the thing, these hero units are all about the kills, and Princess Leia really stands out of the crowd because she's basically the only one that has proper support abilities. She can drop healing items for the other heroes to pick up, and she can drop an energy shield to absorb enemy fire. Meanwhile, Boba Fett is the only one with a perpetual jetpack, and of course he can just fly around and lay waste to pretty much everything everywhere. And if you use them correctly, the heroes are basically unstoppable. If you're, for example, Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker in a very confined environment, you can just lay waste to an entire army by yourself. Now that does change up a bit when you have something like the Heroes vs. Villains mode, which is only available on the smaller maps. And the idea there is that each team spawns with all three of their heroes and they have to protect them and eliminate the enemy team's heroes at the same time. Whichever team loses all of their heroes first loses, and if there is a, still a hero alive, whoever has the most heroes on their team wins. And that particular mode gets pretty chaotic because the other people who are not heroes can continually spawn in as just normal soldiers and use their normal loadouts. And while individually they're pretty much useless against heroes because on a one-to-one -one basis a hero is going to completely and utterly curb stomp you, if you all have them shooting at the one hero all at once, eventually that hero is going to go down. It might take a while, but they are going to go down. But if you're playing one of the other modes, then the hero units are just a pickup on the battlefield, and they're really like any other pickup. They're designed to give you a bunch of free kills, basically. And that's really the biggest problem with this game. It's not so much that this isn't like the original Battlefront games. It's that it's not like them in the wrong ways. Sure, the original Battlefront and Battlefront 2 weren't exactly paragons of complexity or anything, but they understood that teamwork was a thing. You had a class system, and each class had a pretty specific role. There were vehicles on the map that you could jump into and have combined arms warfare. There was a huge number of players available on every map. And of course you had the Galactic Civil War era and the Clone Wars era. So the amount of content was downright huge. When you get to Battlefront 2015, they stripped away pretty much everything that made Battlefront Battlefront. And what you're left with is a ridiculously casualized first person or third person shooter that has basically no value to it whatsoever. I mean seriously, remove the Star Wars license and what would you have? You would have an incredibly crappy game with barely any content in it. And the patches and new content that they put in since launch have not been anywhere near enough to actually bring it up. The problem isn't so much that it is ridiculously lacking in content. I mean, you have barely any maps. They're split into the large maps, which are basically for Walker Assault and nothing else really, because nobody plays anything but Walker Assault on the big maps. And you have a few smaller maps that are meant for the smaller game modes, like say Heroes vs. Villains or whatever. And despite having different layouts than the actual large maps, they still feel like they were just cut content from those. The game just ultimately feels like a total cash grab, like EA said, oh, we've got the Star Wars license, Star Wars Battlefront is a huge name, we better capitalize on that. Hey DICE, get on that. Make as simple and casual a game as you possibly can to rake in as much money as possible and don't give a crap about anything else. And the sad part is, that worked. This game coasts along on its license alone. There is no reason for anyone to play it other than the fact that it is a Star Wars game, and those aren't exactly growing on trees at the moment. But honestly, I would just rather play Battlefront 1 or Battlefront 2 especially. There's just so much more in those games. 
Sure, this one's pretty to look at and the sound is fantastic, but when you get down to it, the gameplay is so incredibly shallow and devoid of depth that it is basically impossible to keep me coming back to it, even though the presentation is fantastic. And the severely dwindling player counts are more than enough to show that it isn't just me that is having this problem. I fully expect this thing to die off within a couple of months, and then EA is probably going to pull the plug because it requires matchmaking and only goes through the EA servers. So it has basically always online DRM, and it will eventually just become a footnote in gaming history. It's actually legitimately depressing. I ultimately can't recommend this game at all. It is completely devoid of depth and has basically no redeeming qualities other than its presentation. If all you want is to look at pretty Star Wars video game visuals and listen to the sounds of Star Wars, then this game will fit the bill. But if you want anything else from your games, this is not it. I give it a 1.5 out of 5. Thanks for watching.